Hey everybody, how's it going? So I'm going to be doing a very quick and dirty read through this paper that a lot of you have been linking me to, Right to Repair, Pricing, Welfare, and Environmental Implications. To set your expectations here, this is a 21 page paper written at a collegiate level, and they are using many equations that somebody who failed chemistry in high school and college is just not gonna be going through. So if you are expecting me to go through this and tell you how accurate I think this is, uh, click X, that, that's not happening. We're going to be going through some of the higher level concepts in this paper, and I'm going to be discussing some of my thoughts and opinions with you. And feel free to chime in in the comments if you actually do understand what 90% of that stuff with, the, with the, all the math and shit means. Now, I'm also going to be doing this video in a different setting than usual. I figured it's kind of nice to have, you know, instead of just being in my New Hampshire apartment or the or checking out the store to do videos from time to time sitting on a deck or a beach or a random location that's kind of nicer, quieter, more relaxing, and I'm going to try and share these locations with you when I can. So let's dig into this paper, shall we? And again, I'm not going to be reading the entire thing. I'm just going to be going over specific points here. So the first point is, strikingly, right-to-repair legislation can potentially lead to a lose-lose outcome that compromises manufacturer profit reduces consumer surplus, and increases the environmental impact, despite repair being made easier and more affordable. This is a, you know, this is a pretty, pretty bold claim. So I would like to dig into it a little bit. Now, um, the first thing that I notice here in page two, which somewhat disappoints me, is that I don't believe that I can trust citations to, well, as I go through this paper. So I'm not going to be clicking on every citation that I see next to a statement, because one of the first ones that I read on page two struck me as immediately incorrect. So it says, whereas the right to repair legislation is likely multifaceted, it is safe to say that once enacted, it will make independent repair easier and less costly. For example, without the right to repair law, phones and tablet parts are often glued together, and devices can easily break when pried apart. Let's read that again. Without right to repair law, phones and tablet parts are often glued together. Now, technically, that's true. Without, you know, phones and tablet parts are often glued together, and we don't have right to repair law right now. However, the implication here, without right to repair law, phone and tablet parts are glued together, is that with right to repair law, phone and tablet parts would not be glued together. Now, when you take a look at the particular citation that they're using, it is a Guardian article from three years ago, and this Guardian article makes no mention of that whatsoever. There is one mention of glue where it says that Jessa discovered that, man, that phones and tablets are glued together, causing components to break when pried apart. Thematics and manuals are copyrighted, keeping them trade secret. But none of this article, zero of this article, says that right to repair legislation would result in a change in how the device is designed. The fact that schematics and parts would be made available is what right to repair law says. No right to repair legislation in the United States of America, sitting in any legislative chamber, says anything about how the device is designed, simply making things available. This is a common misconception that I've talked about in many of my videos, and I have a dedicated video on this. While right to repair is a philosophy, says it would be nice if you would not go out of your way to design the product in a way that makes it difficult to get inside of it, that's the philosophy. The legislative side of it specifically does not seek to change how the product is designed. The last thing that I want is to watch Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer and AOC argue over how a phone is put together. That would be the death of technology in and of itself. That's not what we're asking for because th that's just not something that I think is something that can be easily legislated with rapidly evolving technology. What we are asking for is Whatever it is you put together, how will you put this device together? Can you make sure that people like us are able to buy parts from Intersil or LG or anybody else without being told, sorry, Apple said we can't sell to you? So the fact that right out the gate, there, the fundamental concept of right to repair is somewhat mischaracterized in this paper, it does not give me a lot of faith in the rest of what I'm going to read in this paper. Uh, so let's, let's continue with it. Now, it says here, many believe the true motivation is an economic one. It is understandable that giving consumers the right to repair would hurt manufacturers' bottom line by diminishing repair profit, new product sales. However, it is less clear how the legislation would shape manufacturers' pricing decisions in the product market as they try to mitigate the inevitable profit loss. One thing I think is worth bringing up here is they say it's understandable that giving consumers right to repair would hurt manufacturers' bottom line by diminishing both repair profit and new product sales. Now, many manufacturers, in my opinion, are disingenuous with this. One of them has said, and I, I went through their testimony in this 25-minute long video, that they lose money on repair. And I quote 
from Apple to Congress, for each year since 2009, the cost of providing repair services exceeded the revenue generated by repairs. And I went over in my videos the numerous reasons why I think this is garbage. And in this video, I specific, and this one over here, the November 28th one, I specifically gave a description of how this may be the case, how they came to that disingenuous conclusion. It's sad to say that we're still at a point where manufacturers claim that repair is not a way to make money. Uh, again, Kyle at, uh, at uh, Future Motion that makes the one-wheel electric skateboard has said they're not really making money on repairs or they're not looking to make money on repairs, something like that, in this video that they did where they were addressing a lot of criticisms uh, regarding right to repair with the community. Um, so even, even though like, I appreciate that the article acknowledges that th that it's this is not about cybersecurity and safety, but that it is, you, it's probably an economic motivation. But I think it's important to bring up that most manufacturers at this point in time are not even willing to admit that they make money off of repairs, which I, f I find to be absolutely and utterly ridiculous. So continuing on here, there is an assumption that major brands are going to be cutting prices or cutting durability with right to repair passing. So it says here that product durability in conjunction with the product price, we find that a decrease in independent repair cost may also trigger a similar non-monotone durability response. The manufacturer initially complements the price cut with a reduction of durability to further limit cannibalization. What they mean there with cannibalization is cannibalization of new sales of new products. But when the independent repair cost falls below a certain point, the manufacturer raises the product price and improves durability at the same time to double down on enhancing consumer valuation. Alarmingly, in the former scenario, right to repair legislation prompts manufacturers to produce less durable products. So there's two points that I would want to bring up here. The first, let's just get an idea of what would happen if right to repair actually passed. Do we have any examples where right to repair has actually passed in any industry that we could look to that let's say has eight or nine years of history? In 2012, an automotive right to repair got passed in Massachusetts, which was enacted later on. And I believe, that, and what you can see over here is is prices of many different vehicles over the past 10 or 20 years. So we're just going to bring up a couple of different examples of this. So over here, again, you have pricing of vehicles that went down after a crash and then went back up. Then they went down after the Great Recession, and then they kind of went back up. And you can see right around the time that right to repair passed in the 2012-2013 area, it the pricing is pretty much flat here. This is just, yeah, this this is as flat as can be. Now, granted, it did start to go up a little bit more when you know due to all the COVID BS. But this this is not really about right to repair. If you look at another one, which is uh, let's just take a, take a look at uh, you know different cars and their prices. So you have again you, you, average for the cars that were well selling that year. You know, twenty eight thousand. 25,000, 23,000, 26,000, 27,000, 24,000, 25,000, 22,000, 25,000, 22,000, 25,000. Are you seeing a trend here? This is pretty much not, not going anywhere. You have US consumer price index, new cars and trucks, and you got the same thing. Yeah, it's up, it's down after recession, and then goes back up. And then, you know, just kind of flat, 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 flat. Again, you have the COVID BS, but the COVID BS really does not have anything to do with right to repair when it comes to car prices. So the idea that cars are going to become massively more expensive as a result of right to repair is demonstrably not true because what has happened from car prices from 2012 all the way up until pre-COVID BS, you don't see car prices expanding. Further, when it comes to durability, I understand my audience's demographic. I know that a lot of you are people that are, I'm going to drive my F-150 from 1981 till the day it dies. I'm not going to have no damn computer in my car. I completely understand where you're coming from. And I also understand that a lot of people are going to say that older cars were built a little bit more durably than newer cars. And let's just separate that argument right now from what it is they're saying. If we were to look at a vehicle that was made on average, average vehicle from 2011 or 12, is it really that much less durable than a 2014 or 15 car. Like, are you looking, again, if you're looking at a long-term trend of what's easier to fix, I get it when people say that a car from 30 years ago may have been easier to get to certain components or fix, but when you look at before Massachusetts automotive right to repair afterwards, are we seeing a massive difference here? Are we really seeing cars that are just designed to be completely and utterly disposable at the flip of a light switch between 2004, 12, and let's say 2014 and 15? I don't think even people that are people who are aficionados of older vehicles from the 80s and the 90s would say that there was this magical light switch moment from 2012 to 2014 and 15 where motor vehicles became less repairable. So rather than try and guess how things would be 
With a new right to repair law, we could simply look at how things have gone over the past nine to 10 years with an existing right to repair law where we don't have evidence of what they're saying happening actually happening. Prices were pretty flat for a really long period of time there. Now, the next up is going to be one going over environmental impact and efficiency. It says the total environmental impact follows a similar trend if production and disposal phases are responsible for most of the environmental impact. However, if the use phase is the main contributor, personal use impact of all products is much higher because of degraded energy efficiency. And products deteriorate rapidly with use, so then the whole environmental impact keeps increasing as the independent repair cost fails. Now, they did try and come up with a little formula over here to try and figure out what the environmental impact would be regarding efficiency, older products, newer products. And I am, I'll be honest with you, I am not going to look at this and try to tell you that this is right or that this is wrong because again I had a freaking cheat to get out of chemistry in high school and I flunked out of it in college and I also failed pre-calculus so if somebody wants to dig into this and tell me what they think of that by all means that being said what my criticism would be I'm going to take a wild guess that what you see over here is not taking into in account certain things I don't think that this is something you could reasonably predict again are we talking about people that are using a 486 laptop instead of getting an M1 MacBook and the energy efficiency that's ruined there by trying to get the exact same computation done with a 486 versus an M1 MacBook? Or are we talking about somebody using a six-year-old laptop instead of using a two-year-old one? Like, it's really difficult to figure this out. You know, if, there's no model to discuss buying a laptop that uses 35 watts in 2020, 25 watts in 2022, 10 watts in 2024, and how that would be used versus using the 35 watt laptop for an average of four years. What is the difference in environmental impact using the 35 watt laptop that's average 35 watt for a little bit longer versus the, let's say, laptop that uses an average of 10 watts for, uh, you know, for a shorter and shorter period of time. Like there's no nor is there any way I think anybody's even going to realistically attempt to gauge what devices would be used for how much longer at what efficiency loss, if any there be, from extended use of old technology. I don't think that this is doing it. Admit, I'll admit, I honestly don't know what this thing is doing at all, to be honest with you, but uh, <laughs> maybe somebody in my audience could tell me. But I, re I don't think that that's going to be easy to do. Like I have a camcorder that uses 5 watts. I could use that for 5 years, or I could get a camcorder that uses 5 watts this year, four watts next year, three watts the year after that, and one watt four years after that, which has a higher environmental impact, digging up everything necessary to build that thing and then throwing out the old one or using the camcorder that uses a little bit more wattage for a little much longer period of time. How do you know how much longer people are using those devices? How do you know what the power differential is between the older device and the newer device on a mass scale? I am just going to take a wild guess that this does not take all that into account, but tries to make a guess and... Um, Go from there. The most interesting part of this to me is what you get on pay, around page 11, though. This is a part that I'm going to come at more from, and I guess I'm going to make more of an economic argument than a mathematical one. When the production cost is high, the new product price is inevitably high, causing low demand for new products. In this case, the manufacturer can offer the repair service as a means to strengthen consumers' willingness to pay for the high-priced product and stimulate demand. It is optimal for the manufacturer to give out the repair service for free, such that all consumers who experience a product failure seek repair from the manufacturer. A free repair service enhances the resale value of a product in the event of a product failure, enabling the manufacturer to charge a higher new product price upfront that factors in the repair cost that may later incur a, in a service provision. Thus, full repair emerges in an equilibrium. Such a strategy can be interpreted as a lifetime warranty or a form of servicization that integrates service into product sales. Now, there are two different types of repairs that we do here at the store. Actually, I would say three types. The first is standard wear and tear that happens when a product gets old. The second are design flaws specific to the product we're working on because almost every single year, Apple does some sort of fuck up that makes their product disposable. We, you know, whether we're talking about C7771, C9560, 2011 GPU issues, the U8900 issue, Flexgate, there's, oh my God, I have, I have 20 minute long videos going over all the engineering fails. That's something that's not the fault of the consumer that is the fault of the manufacturer. And the third is just things just break. You know, there's thing like something breaks because it's just kind of getting old. I guess I would put that in category one. So let me just rephrase that. Three types of repairs. First type of repair is the customer breaks the product themselves, like accidentally damages it. Repair type one is they broke it. 
Repair type two is the device is just not designed to be that durable. They have design flaws because Apple doesn't know how to make a laptop and that, that's a lot of repairs. The customer didn't have anything to do with it. And the third type of repair is where the product just kind of, I don't know, it just breaks down because of normal wear and tear. Now, we, let's focus on repair type number one over there. Repair type two and three may be a static. That may be something where the manufacturer can estimate what they imagine the repairs are going to be for their product, right? Repair type number one, they cannot. To try to estimate this would be like trying to keep a ping pong ball down using one finger in a bucket of water. It is impossible because it is a moving target. We are, it's not possible to assume that people are not going to change their behavior when you change your policy. And this is something that gets talked about a lot in this book called Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. You can't expect that when you change a policy that people's behavior is going to remain the same. People's behavior is going to adapt to changes in policy. So let's say the manufacturer says that repairs are now free. Given that many of the repairs that we do are one of those three categories is accidental physical damage, the user themselves being careless, do you think that people's carelessness will go up or will go down when repair becomes free? I would argue that people would become more careless as a result of repair becoming free. Since there is now lesser, and there's no cost to being careless, now you can only focus on the benefits of being careless. Like my phone feels better when it doesn't have a case on, or it's, it's more convenient for me to keep water, you know, my cup of water next to my laptop and so on and so forth without focusing on the negative of I will have to pay to fix that. As a result of that, it is going to be close to impossible for a manufacturer to figure out how much it would cost them to offer a free repair service because the incentive structure is going to change when they change their policy and people's behavior is going to change as a result of that. So this concept of even being able to create any sort of mathematical model to discuss how the product price may go up and how free repair may affect the marketplace, in my opinion, is a null and void talking point because that's never going to happen. No manufacturer is ever going to make repair free because repair being free would result in such a massive shift in consumer behavior that it would most likely wind up bankrupting the company as a result of having to fix all these devices that people are destroying on their own. I'm very curious what you think of this paper. Again, I'm scratching this. To be clear, I am not going over all of the mathematical models, nor am I going over the uh, many of these equations because I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> that's not me. I've been very, very honest and upfront about my education or my lack of education. And when I see this, you know, I, I just kind of feel like jumping into a lake, to be honest with you. But let me know what you think of this down below. I will link to it. Again, I... I, I don't. I think that they they do bring up some interesting points, but I don't think that they're points that wind up holding water when you attach them to to dem demonstrable reality. If they did, we would have seen car prices skyrocket after the right to repair bill passed. We would have seen durability go into the shitter after automotive right to repair passed. And above all, one of the things that they're talking about here is how the products are. You know, they, the manufacturer if repair becomes more available, they may make the device more cheaper or more durable. And something to understand here, it's really important, is over the past 10 years, the independent repair industry has boomed. I remember what it was like getting into this business in 2008 and 2009. You didn't have like 30 shops on Yelp and every zip code that were doing consumer electronics device repair. And now you kind of do for a lot of locales. So there is a lot more, even without a right to repair bill, there's so many more options for independent repair right now than there were 10 years ago. Has the flagship iPhone come down in price? Has it gone up in durability? Has the Samsung Galaxy, is the Samsung Galaxy S a phone that is like, you know, going down in price from when it was first released? Or is it something that's going up in price from when it was first released? When we're talking about flagship phones, are they, you know, insanely more durable outside of just, you know, the minor improvements that are made year after year as technology evolves? And I would argue that that's not the case at all. But you let me know what you think in the comments down below. And also let me know what you think of the scenery outside. It is an absolutely beautiful day, uh, even though it is cloudy. I guess the reason I think it's a beautiful day is because my scenery is better than it usually is. And hopefully yours is too. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. See you all in the next video. Bye now.